All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team here? And this is BXJS Weekly, episode 78, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we have some stuff today. We got some uh, pretty nice getting started tutorials. We got uh, quite a bit of really cool articles to discuss and some very sad ones regarding the uh, funding experiment from StandardJS. And uh, there's also a bunch of libraries and demos and usual. And how DNS works in our interesting section, which is actually quite amazing explainer. But uh, let's get started with the getting started section as usual. The first article we got here today is the regex tutorial, beginner's guide to regular expressions using JavaScript. This is a pretty good write up on what the regular expressions are and how do you get started using them along with the basic examples of the most common use cases that you would need them for. So if you're just getting started with JavaScript and you are not sure what the regexes are and how to use them, this is basically for you. Next thing we got here is complete intro to React version 5 and intermediate React version 2, which is just as Dial says, is a very good um, kind of tutorial, I guess, or complete introduction as the title says to the React and everything around it, starting from the ESLint, Prettier, Parcel, Hooks, effects, dev tools, whatever you can imagine, everything is here. Uh, it was written by the uh, Brian Holtz, um, who is an author of quite a bunch of uh, pretty good libraries and also have written quite a few very interesting articles. So yeah, it's actually of high quality. And uh, essentially, if you're getting started with React and you feel like the official documentation is not enough for you, just have a look here. This explains basically everything you have to know, to be honest including more advanced topics like retruder, emotion, code splitting, server-side rendering, and stuff like this. Just basically all in one guide, yeah. So it's uh, quite good. Next thing we got here is closures in JavaScript. Why do we need them? A pretty nice deep dive into the closures, what they are and why do we need them. Again, you know, it's a very beginner level article. So if you're just getting started, it's gonna be great to read it for you. Um, if you already know what closures are and you kind of understand them, you won't, you, well, let me try that again. You won't really find any new information here because it's kind of very basic, but a good article nonetheless. All right, the next thing we got here is JavaScript iterators and generators, synchronous iterators. This is the write up on synchronous iteration and the symbol.iterator and how do you create your own iterable and how do you actually use it in a different approaches. So um, I would say it's, you know, like beginner slash intermediate level. If you're already familiar with iteration and you know what symbol iterable is and how it works, you won't really find anything new here. If you don't, then do uh, have a read through. It is actually pretty damn good. All right, next thing we got here is optional chaining article from V8 dev blog that uh, deep dives into the optional chaining and explains how it works. One cool thing to note here is that, you know, if you already know what the optional chaining is, which is not very likely unless you're following the JavaScript very closely because it's not even yet released anywhere. Um, you won't really find anything new here, right? It's just very straightforward. It compares it to stuff like uh, underscore uh, lodash.gets or underscore.gets that uh, gets the name by the path, uh, value by the path is what I wanna say. Uh, the cool thing is what's worth noting is that the fact that they did an article means that the implementation in V8 is nearly there. So it is already stage three uh, proposal. So it's gonna be shipped quite soon-ish. I'm hoping in the next couple of months and then maybe we'll see it released uh, into Node until the end of year, which would be absolutely amazing. But nonetheless, a pretty good introduction to the optional chaining. So if you need one, do have a look. Next thing we got here is a practical guide to symbols in JavaScript. Everything you ever wanted to know about symbols, what they are, how are they useful, and when do you actually want to use them. It's not very long, but a very good introduction to the symbols. So if you are getting started with JavaScript and you don't know what the symbols are, this is for you. If you already know what symbols are, well, you won't really find anything new here. Next thing we got here is translate your React app with ease using Facebook's own framework called FBT. Now, this is essentially a tutorial for FBT that guides you through setting up the app, uh, adding FBT and translating it into two languages, including all the scripts that you will have to write to extract and transform and convert stuff and setting up Babel plugin and, and such. Um, 
yeah, I guess, you know, if you're already working with internationalization and you know how FBT works, you want to really find anything new here. If you never heard about FBT as did I, for example, then this is a really good tutorial that guides you through everything. And uh, yeah, that's basically all I have to say about that. All right, um, next thing we got here is write fewer tests, longer tests from Mr. Can See Dots. This is the last article and getting started section we've got here. And this article sort of deep dives into the testing and writing a longer and fewer tests as the title says. And uh, as in writing tests that sort of repeats the user interaction. So, you know, not just testing one tiny thing, but actually write tests that do a lot of things in chain, right? And it also outlines some typical um, issues that p people do, um, now let me try to rephrase that. They also outline some typical caveats and problems that people can get when writing smaller tests that share some mutable variables and stuff like this. And I will admit, I also wrote, I mean, I still, I, th I think I still have some tests that are written this way, which is, you know, not perfect, but it's a really good guide essentially. So if you are looking to be better at testing, then do check this one out. Again, the tests here are specifically for React.js, but uh, I think majority of the advices apply to, well, pretty much everything else. All right, this is it for the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news section. First article we got here is JavaScript, the modern parts. Um, this was pretty interesting write up that goes uh, sort of, you know, from the 1998, I guess, when the author just started doing JavaScript and traces the changes in JavaScript language and JavaScript ecosystem over time from, you know, 1998 when JavaScript didn't matter at all and was like, okay, you just use a bit of JavaScript to make your website shiny to 2008 when there was like the good parts, jQuery, we finally got Firebug and everything and, you know, and to modern JavaScript when JavaScript is actually everywhere and it is a lot better and faster than, uh, well, quite a bunch of other languages and why you shouldn't ignore JavaScript. It's a very interesting write up on the history and the position of JavaScript in today's development world. So if you are interested in that, I would highly recommend reading it. I mean, it's not too long, but uh, there is some interesting stuff here and some interesting um, things that I honestly personally have already forgotten, but yes, they were like, you know, the absence of actual debugging in JavaScript. That was a thing. There were no dev tools, no debuggers, and you have to suffer basically trying to figure out what's wrong. And, you know, just thinking about that, thinking about how tooling evolved and how awesome the tooling we got today is, um, is an interesting journey. So there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is brig, uh, blah, let me try that again. Bridging Node.js and Python with PyNode to predict home prices. So I showed off the PyNode package last podcast, I think, and it uh, basically allows you to integrate or to invoke Python scripts from Node.js, right? And this article is a tutorial for that that shows you how you can um, take Python, build a house predicting model in Python, which is extremely easy to do because, you know, Python machine learning scene is huge. And then call that from Node.js to actually, uh, yeah, calculate the, uh, uh, predict the prices, right? Within the JavaScript app, which is actually relatively straightforward. So it's just, you know, scikit-learn for Python and then uh, Express for the serving it from uh, Node.js as a REST API and you are done. It is very straightforward, very nice and uh, actually surprisingly easy to write. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is preserving flash content with WebAssembly done right. Uh, again, we already talked last podcast about the new project. Uh, what was it called? Ruffle. Yes, exactly. Which is a Rust re-implementation of uh, Flash Player, right? Now, the thing is, this is not a first re-implementation attempt at re-implementing Flash. And the author here is, you know, authored LightSpark, which is a C++ implementation, which is older and more complex, let's put it this way, right? We also had Shumway, which is a Mozilla sponsored attempt at basically transpiling the flash into the stuff like Canvas and modern HTML5 features. The problem is all of those are very limited and a lot of them uh, do not implement support for a lot of APIs that Flash Player has. So the author here came up with a insane idea that actually might work. Uh, the idea is that instead of taking the SVF file and having your own custom Flash player that would use the web platform essentially, you would actually have a 
SVF file, then it will have a Flash Player plugin as is, and then it will have a WebAssembly based recompiler that would recompile the Flash Player on the fly into something that can work in the browser. Which sounds absolutely crazy, but is probably the best way to do that, you know, to make it 100% compatible because you're essentially just running the same Flash Player. Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, recompiler is called Chirp X, and it, it basically allows you to run unmodified x86 binaries in the browser in the WebAssembly, which sounds absolutely crazy. <laughs> but I love this idea. So if you're interested, the article has a bit more details about that and also outlines why the author thinks this approach would work better than actually trying to recreate the Flash player. It is, uh, on one hand, it's fascinating to read that. On the other hand, it's absolutely terrifying that the fact that you can actually run x86 binaries inside of the browser. I'm wondering if there's like any security implications on this end, but it's a really cool write-up. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There is some interesting information here. All right, next thing we got here is the story of V8 performance cliff in React. A really detailed and a really cool write-up on uh, one of the problems that React encountered while running in the V8 engine specifically. There is a lot of very detailed explanation as to why this happens. And, and uh, like I guess 70% of it describes how exactly uh, V8 perceives and works with objects and their shapes and how it optimizes for the specific shapes and so on and so forth. And why just one tiny thing in React code caused this to de-optimize the code essentially. So this is the problematic bit. It is in the fiber and uh, essentially the thing is that they, they initialized the value for the fiber node, which is an object with zero, which made it um, the SMI uh, representation, right? And then they use performance.now, which is the floating point timestamp, which caused the representation to uh, go into double representation, which basically made it de-optimized, which is, it is insane when you think about it, how much stuff you have to keep in mind when working with things, if you want them to be highly optimized. If that sounds interesting, do read through the article. There is some very, very cool information here and a very detailed explanation of why that happened, how that happens, and how exactly the V8 engine views the whole, you know, object structure, object shapes, and how it tries to optimize to make them faster and why the deopt happens, right? So this is kind of the core thing. But it's a fascinating article, so highly recommend it. Right, next thing we got here, service workers at Slack, our quest for faster boot time and offline support. So this is a write up about the new version of the Slack desktop, which is a lot faster and I've heard a lot of good things for it. I have not tried it yet myself because I just switched completely to the uh, progressive app apps that I just have as a pop up windows basically. Works perfectly fine too. Uh, but yeah, apparently they managed to speed up the desktop app quite a lot and service workers is the center of this speed increase. And the article especially talks about, you know, how did they use service workers? How did they help them speed this stuff up? How exactly they are used within the Slack app specifically? What did they do with them? And so on and so forth. So if you are exploring service workers and you wanna see, uh, wanted to see sort of uh, existing implementations, do check this one out, it's actually really cool. There's also some performance charting and uh, stuff like this. So it's actually quite interesting. Right, next thing we got here is the baseline interpreter, a fast JavaScript interpreter in Firefox 70. So apparently Firefox 70 is gonna have a new baseline interpreter for JavaScript that should speed up the code execution quite significantly. So this article goes into depth uh, to show why exactly they decided to add yet another interpreter into compilation pipeline in Firefox, because it's an additional module there. It's not something that they rewritten or modified. And how exactly does it help um, specifically optimize the code execution? So this specific um, um, interpreter focuses on uh, bailout, which is the code deoptimization. So you have, uh, when the code executes uh, in engine, right? You first have the C++ interpreter, then you have the baseline JIT code, then you got the ION and baseline JIT that work together. And then at some point, if the code becomes less used, it de-optimizes back into the baseline compiler, right? And this is what is called bailout. And this was the core problem with the um, 
with the current implementation because the C++, C++ interpreter is actually slow and doesn't collect time information. So recompiling the same function takes quite a lot of time. So they were like, okay, so we can actually circumvent it by adding baseline interpreter that would be a lot faster. And this is exactly what happens with the new pipeline. So when the code bails out, it actually bails out into the baseline interpreter that already has a bunch of metadata and uh, types information and so on and so forth, which is cached so that it no longer needs so much time as before. And um, the performance results are actually pretty insane. So it's like, as you can see here, just by adding this baseline interpreter, even without JIT, um, they've decreased the time by, what is it? It's like almost 300 milliseconds, which is kind of crazy. And by adding JIT, it cuts down the time even more. And if you take the speedometer benchmark, it's, yeah, all basically doubles the points even more than that, which is just insane. Like, like look at this, this is so great. If you are interested in the more you know technical details and description of what the bailout is, because my explanation is probably not very good, and how exactly does the baseline interpreter work? How does it solve this problem? Do have a look at the article. It does a very good job of explaining all of that, even if you have no idea how the pipeline works. It is very interesting, and I quite um, kind of can't wait for the Firefox 70 to come out to the main line to see how exactly it's gonna behave and how much faster than V8 is gonna be. This is uh, quite exciting. All right, right, now we're getting to the um, JavaScript drama of the week, I guess. So this is the afterfall of the um, experiment with funding from Ferris, who is the author of Standard.js. We talked last week about the Standard.js trying to display advertisements on NPM install, right? And there was like an insane backlash and um, there's the write-up from the author of Standard.js, Ferris himself, that explains his reasoning behind that. Why did he decide to try that? What was the problem? And um, how exactly it basically ended up. This is a pretty lengthy write-up with a lot of reasoning and a lot of thoughts on funding and stuff like this. Um, what I, like, the way it blew over is just, crazy in my opinion. So I just, you know, just to give you some context, one of the numbers here is that uh, Ferris spent about 3000 unpaid hours over the last four years maintaining some of his popular open source packages. And that is a lot of time, unpaid time, right? And he was looking for a way to get paid. Now funding is not the first option that he tried. So this ads in, in, in terminal is not the first option. And he outlines what he tried before. There was the thanks package, there was the Patreon, there was the tide lift, there was the GitHub sponsors, there's the paid consulting. And he says that if he does all of that together, he kind of can live on that, but it doesn't make for a comfortable living, right? So it's, it's basically, it, he gets less money than if he would work for a corporation and do some closed source stuff and not do open source at all, right? Or maybe do it whenever he has time, which might be never. And uh, it's a very sad situation. Like I, I get, you know, I get the point of people saying, okay, we don't want ads in our open source packages. We don't want ads in our command line. But I also get the maintainer point, right? Because I, like I own a couple of small open source projects that I maintain in my free time. And like Exoframe, for example, is relatively popular. It's like has few, um, what was it? I think like 20,000 installs or something and uh, about uh, 700 stars on GitHub. So, so, you know, not the smallest project, but not the largest as well, not really popular. But I lately just don't have time to work on it. And I had people who come out and, and you know, start complaining how I'm not updating it frequently enough or how something is broken. And when I say that, okay, just send me a pull request, I'll be more than happy to, you know, review it and merge it if it fixes that. They just go bitching how I'm not doing enough work. It's it, like, why would I, all right? I'm not getting paid for that. And that's kind of the whole point. Now with the funding experiment, uh, on one hand he talked, you know, like, okay, so the ads would kind of help him get a bit more money for, uh, to work on that stuff and would it incentivize maintainers. So his idea was that actually funding as a module would not be just funding uh, the standard JS, but actually would be uh, used by third-party maintainers who would include it into their projects and the uh, funding from that module would actually get distributed across people who have that in their projects and who maintain something open source, right? Um, 
obviously it didn't work out. There was an insane backlash and the amount of crazy things people say basically about that is just, well, like it makes me very sad. Let me just put it this way. There's people in comments. I mean, again, you know, I get the idea that you don't like ads. I don't like ads as well, right? And um, that's like, the problem is we don't really have a better model for that. This is kind of the thing. Nobody, there's been so many attempts to make open source funding better, but we haven't seen any work out yet at all. Like we got Patreon and that works for people who are really, really big, like Cinderosaurus, for example, right? He has like thousands of modules. All of them are really good. He has established reputation and this is why he got a few thousand dollars on Patreon. Again, this is not, you know, some insane amounts of money. This is something that you can kind of live on, right? And um, everything else is basically failed. I'm guessing the GitHub funding is going to be like okay-ish as well. You're going to get like some beer money from that. GitHub sponsors um, Tidelift. I don't even know what is that. It's probably something like a Patreon, right? Yeah, so it seems like another way to fund projects. It's not working. And uh, people in comments who say that you should just find a corporate job and then do open source in your free time, I, I don't think they've ever maintained anything large enough. Like you, you can't... If, you, if we're talking about the project as big as, for example, ESLint, you cannot maintain that in your free time or it's gonna take years to actually deliver the next update, which is obviously not something we want, right? So as a, as a user of open source, you want it to be updated, you want it to be nice, you want it to be with fresh features every few months, but it's not viable unless the person who does it gets paid. And this whole situation is just crazy. And here's the interesting point as well. So the people saying like, you know, just find the corporation to sponsor it. The exact same people complain about corporations owning too much open source. Like, hey, Facebook owns React, it's bad, blah, blah, blah. And then and then in the other thread, they're just like, yeah, find a corporation to find, like what? <laughs> this whole situation is bonkers. And um, I really, I've been trying to come up with a way that would work nicely for, you know, in sort of a funding way. But I, like I spent a couple of days thinking about that sort of in the back of my head, but I couldn't found any viable model. And I think this could be actually a very nice uh, startup that could um, help a lot of people, but probably it's not there yet because nobody cracked this whole like open source funding thing yet. We're gonna see how that develops. Now, the aftermath of the ads in the uh, command line tools were, first of all, that NPM actually banned terminal ads. Um, there was like a day or two after the whole, you know, drama started, uh, after the um, NPM, the standard ads got uh, covered in the general media. They were just like, okay, so you're no longer allowed to publish to NPM packages that display ads at a runtime on installation or at any other stages of software development lifecycle, such as via NPM scripts. Packages with codes that can be used to display ads are fine. So if you have like libraries for ads, that's totally okay. Packages that themselves function primarily as ads are only also disallowed, right? Um, and <laughs> here's the interesting thing, on one hand, there's a lot of people who welcome that, right? And I, I get the idea that again, ads can be abused. We see what happened to the web and like it's impossible to use the web without ad blocker if you want to make it comfortably, especially on the mobile devices. But on the other hand, we don't really have any viable alternative for funding of open source. Like literally there is nothing. Again, you know, if you're not very popular, if you don't have like thousands and thousands of people who follow you and you are Cindrosaurus or someone at his caliber who can afford to have a Patreon that basically gives you enough money, you're not gonna earn anything from open source. I've been maintaining ExoFrame for, what is it, three years now? I've earned zero from it, right? And, and like at least a few thousand people actually use it on a monthly basis. And uh, you know, I, I'm okay with that because I do it in my free time and it's not actively developed and no critical infrastructure likely depends on it, but um, if we're taking something like ESLint and then the maintainers just disappear because they don't have any incentives to maintain it, a lot of JavaScript community is not going to be happy about it. And that, yeah, it's, it's, the whole situation is very weird. And uh, yeah, so after they banned the ads, they got a lot of slack actually from the open source maintainers and open source developers. 
for sort of trying to kill off one of the potential revenue streams, even though, you know, it's obviously didn't work out in this case, there were other options, right? But um, after that, uh, I think a day after they blocked the ads, they are announced an initiative that will make easy to fund open source contributions um, to launch by the end of the year. So they're like, kind of, okay, we closed the ads, but now are gonna offer you a different way to earn money on your NPM packages, which is like, yeah, okay, let's let's see where that goes. It looks like from, you know, they, they posted this uh, blog post here that describes, okay, we're gonna work together with the maintainers on ways to fund open source and NPM is in a good position to do that and blah, blah, blah. Honestly, from this post, it seems like they have no idea what they're gonna do. They just did that to, you know, sort of make it look nicer that they disallowed ads and sort of, hey, we're gonna block the ads, but we're gonna provide you a way to earn money in a different way, but we don't know which way yet, which, um, let's see how that develops. It certainly looks interesting. Again, they invite all the maintainers who are interested to basically talk to them uh, or whoever has the opinions on that, right? And oh man, this this whole situation is again painful to look at. But on the other hand, is we we got to change something, right? Otherwise, the open source is just gonna disappear at some point because most of the people won't have enough incentives to do that anymore, right? And they need to eat something. They're just gonna get jobs at Fang or whatever and stop working or work on it in the weekends. We're gonna get ESLint updates once every five years or something, which is totally viable scenario. But um, yeah, there you go. You can read all of those articles yourself. Uh, as usual, they're available on the uh, current episodes listing. And uh, yeah, the whole situation just make me very sad and bittersweet. But uh, let's go to the back to... <laughs> Back to the podcast. So uh, next section we got is tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. And the first article we got here today is going beyond NPM, meet yarn and PNPM. A nice introduction and comparison of NPM, yarn, and PNPM, and how do they differ and what is the sort of um, advantages of using one over the other. So if you never heard about yarn or PNPM, do check it out. There are some interesting differences that I didn't know about some of them. Uh, so definitely a pretty nice uh, introduction to them. Next thing we got here is checklist for choosing an optimal NPM package. A pretty nice write up on how to pick the best package from a variety of options, including checking vulnerabilities, checking how a package is maintained. Is there any bugs that will affect your specific use case? Is the package size acceptable? How does it compare to other similar packages? There's actually a bunch of very nice tools mentioned here that I did not know about. So make sure to check this one out. And also the version compatibility, which is unfortunately still a thing that exists when some packages that you use might not be compatible with other versions of other packages you might want to use, which is an absolute pain in ass, but this is in indeed a case and some uh, like sometimes basically. <laughs> All right. Next thing we got here is making a weight more functional in JavaScript, or as I call it, the Golang error handling pattern. Um, very nice way. So, you know, you typically handle the await with try catch, which is, I mean, it works, right? It's, it's okay. But it can be annoying when you have a lot of different errors and you try catch a lot of different things and it just gets complicated very quickly. The easier way to do that is to actually return uh, from your promise, you return a value and then you return an error as a second um, parameter or no wait, second value in the array. So you return array with a value error and then you check for error. And if it's an error, then you either rethrow it or react to it somehow. This is exactly how Golang works. Like if you, if you go and learn Golang, this is like the first pattern, it's everywhere there. It might get annoying at one point and uh, sometimes it's actually easier to use bubbling in promises, but this is a viable approach. It actually worked quite well. And there's a nice library here that allows you to wrap it instead of doing it manually. Although I don't know if it's you know worth using the whole library for that. Uh, when you write your own custom functions, just return a user an error and you're basically done. Um, it is a nice pattern, so do check it out. That sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is um, a set of threads on Twitter that um, are essentially talking about what happens when you launch one of the set of browsers here for the first time on Windows machine in this case. 
Now, uh, this thread talks about Google Chrome. So what happens when you launch it first is, and you know, what kind of requests does it make? What kind of things does it ask from Google? Who does it notify that you launched the browser? What, is, what extensions does it pull and so on and so forth. There is insane amount of things that it actually does behind the uh, curtain. And not all of them are, you know, terrifying and ominous or whatever, but it is fascinating how much setup happens in the background when you just launch the browser first time. So this one talks about Chrome. There is also one for Opera, Vivaldi, Descender, Brave, and Firefox, I believe as well. So make sure to check them out. There's some very interesting information actually. All right, uh, next thing we got here is CSS can do this and it's terrifying. Um, look into what can you do with the CSS um, to scare the hell out of you, like CSS Keylogger. I believe I covered the original article that talked about this about a year ago, maybe, maybe a bit less. But yes, you can essentially do key logging with uh, CSS and it circumvents a uh, course and everything else because it's just, you know, loading images or kind of images, but in reality it just logs your keystrokes, which is terrifying, but yes, that's the thing. Um, you can track users with CSS. You And yes, the CSS is true and complete and there's some insane examples over here. So uh, if that sounds interesting, do check out the article and get terrified because it is, I mean, you know, the CSS is true and complete, which means you can do pretty much anything with it. So there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is announcing the first Postgres extension to run WebAssembly. Yes, this is from the Vasmer guys and uh, it's an extension for Postgres that allows you to run WebAssembly mini extensions to it. So they kind of go to outline where you can run WebAssembly now and it seems like you can run it pretty much anywhere these days. So it's like PHP, Python, Ruby, Go, Net, C Sharp, R, even R has the WebAssembly extension now. And now they publish Postgres X VASM, which allows you to build a WebAssembly function and then invoke it in your query within the Postgres. So in this case, they give a very simple example. When they write a Rust function that does the sum, uh, they compile it to WebAssembly module and then they just load it into the uh, Postgres and then they can run this some function within the Postgres and obviously it's gonna be executed within the WebAssembly itself and it's gonna be quite fast and I'm terrified of the possibilities that this brings to the Postgres, but um, this is pretty impressive and cool nonetheless. <laughs> so if you are curious to check it out, this also gives some benchmarks uh, showing, yeah, the Fibonacci sequence. I mean, I guess you can calculate the Fibonacci sequence using the PGSQL, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, obviously the WebAssembly is winning here, right? Because it's literally running in Vast Mansion, but um, nonetheless, a really cool one. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is the WebSocket stream is now available in Chrome Canary and there's a whole explainer of how that works and why you would want that. Essentially, the core idea is that now when you, um, instead of creating just a WebSocket, you have an option to create WebSocket stream which will give you the data as a readable stream that you can iterate over or you know consume in any way that you would typically consume the stream. It also gives you the writable stream uh, to send the data back. It might be useful in some cases. I personally don't think, um, I personally don't know when I would need something like that, but I guess I did, just didn't have a proper use case. Hey, Soli, uh, thank you, uh, Swelt. I, yeah, I will talk, so let me just finish the articles and I will talk about Svelte a bit. I've used it already. It is actually pretty good. Uh, but okay, continuing. We got a tweet from Ferris. So, you know, because of the whole standard JS uh, drama with ads, he got a lot of people on Reddit saying very mean and silly things about him, which is again, unfortunate that we have a community that is this dismissing. And one of the complaints were like, hey, so he has a package that is is buffer, that is just does buffer dot is buffer, and it used 14 million times a week, right? Downloaded 40 million times a week. And um, even though he didn't need to do this, he actually went to explain why is buffer exists and why now it is just buffer is buffer. But you know, the thing is that it wasn't always the case, right? So there's this hidden complexity to just about any package you have and almost nothing exists for just because it has to exist, right? It's like, yeah, I'll just make this is string package because I mean, okay, obviously there are some people that do that and there's like trolls on NPM or whatever, 
But majority of the packages actually exist for a reason, right? And here's the thing. So here's the write-up about the buffer. And uh, the write-up here, so the cool thing is that the buffer package is used in the web pack, right? And they created the is buffer package in so that they could include just is buffer instead of including the whole buffer package because Webpack bundles that code into browser, right? And in browser, you don't actually care, like you don't have the buffer uh, definition yet in the browser. I believe there is a, at least, uh, I think I was seeing the, what was it? The TC39 proposal or something, but they basically wanna take buffer into the browser, but it's not there yet. And if you take, you know, when the Webpack was conceived, like what? three, four years ago, obviously it was only in the Node.js, but you needed a way to check if something is a buffer, right? Browser only has uint eight arrays essentially, and there was no buffer. So shipping the whole buffer package with a buffer class, instead they just created this buffer as buffer, right? So is, okay, let me, <laughs> let me change this. So they, you, um, okay. So shipping the buffer package just to check and use one method, which is buffer is buffer is an overkill, right? There's like seven kilobytes of the whole buffer implementation just to run one function is a waste. So they created an is buffer package that essentially extracted this buffer is buffer method into a standalone package. Now, right now it's trivial because we have buffer is buffer and you can just polyfill it for older environments or even drop them as is because they're no longer used like Node.js. 0.10 or Safari 5.7, which I believe is both of those are end of life is no longer used, right? But three, four years ago, you couldn't do that. You actually needed to check for them. And there was like 200 caveats that you have to keep in mind. So there is an original implementation. Like if you look at the buffer is buffer right now, right? So the package here is literally just A. So if object has is buffer and object is buffer, then you're done. So it's buffer is buffer, right? That's very easy. Now, if you look at the legacy implementation, there's like different caveats and things in check for Node.js v10, for Safari, for other, I imagine there was even older, more complex implementations. So next time you see a package that literally does one thing, don't go dismissing it. Just think, of, what, was it always like this? Or was there like 25 different checks for legacy stuff that actually made it work? and made it easier for Webpack in this case and smaller for Webpack to actually check if something is a buffer. Um, obviously, you know, I'm terrible. I'm probably terrible at explaining that. But if you are curious, again, I've linked the tweet here and it is very interesting write up. So I would encourage you to read through it and see what exactly does it mean to maintain even a tiny package. Just think about how much complexity this three line package has like over the years, right? So it's not just like you build it one time and you forget about it. You have to maintain it, change it. And again, it brings us to the same, you know, lack of funding, lack of incentives for the open source developers to actually do that. And I'm still surprised the open source is alive to be honest, but uh, there we go. All right, um, now we're coming to the releases section. The first release of the week is Feathers 4. This is a pretty nice framework for the real-time apps and REST APIs. And uh, they just released the version four that brings in the TypeScript support, uh, authentication friendly support with uh, stuff like JSON web tokens, OWUTH and everything baked in, which uh, seems quite nice. And also is more user friendly than before with a new homepage and new documentation powered by ViewPress that looks very nice by the way. So if you are using Feathers, make sure to check out the new version. If you never heard about it, do check it out. It is pretty nice. Hey Memphis, welcome to the stream. All right, next release we got here is Dojo 6. This is a name I haven't heard in a while. So uh, Dojo is a framework that's been around since 2007, eight maybe. I honestly don't remember when I've seen the first version, but it's a very old one and they're still alive and kicking. And um, there it is in version six, which now has the uh, hook support. So you basically has the React hooks or, you know, Dojo hooks now, I guess. <laughs> Uh, which looks quite nice actually. So it seems like they're also using JSX like syntax and they're supporting TypeScript. So it seems like it's a very modern, very nice library now. If you never heard about it, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you want. If you are using the older versions, make sure to update, I guess, because it looks pretty fascinating to be honest. I'm, I'm really surprised to see this still live and kicking and actually very modern, really great. 
All right, next thing we got here is TypeScript 3.6, which has been released with a bunch of, I guess, incremental updates and some improvements like stricter generators, more accurate array spread, and a bunch of other changes. So if you're using TypeScript, yes, make sure to upgrade, no breaking changes. Um, hey, Dragon, welcome to the stream. When is the Rust and WebAssembly stream? When I feel that I know Rust good enough because I am struggling with, I, like I just started learning it and it's great actually, but it's, <laughs> It's damn hard to write on a language that is so low level after using stuff like Golang and JavaScript, you know? But we're probably gonna do that at one point because it's actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. But okay, back to the releases. We got React Native version 0.61, release candidate zero. So this is a release candidate, it's not stable yet, but I'm guessing we're gonna see the release sometime next or maybe in two weeks or so, but uh, I'm guessing this week, actually. And uh, yeah, the um, highlight of this release is the fast refresh, the new hot reloading experience that I highlighted a um, couple of weeks ago, maybe even more, a month ago or so from uh, Dan Abramov on Twitter. He shared some very nice looking hot reloading for React Native. And uh, yeah, this basically brings it here, uh, along with a bunch of other improvements. So if you're working on React Native, make sure to check it out. This looks quite exciting. Cannot wait for the actual release. And uh, this is actually it for the releases. So now we're coming to the libraries and demos. The first uh, demo we got here is Web Camera, a camera controls for the web. So this is a progressive web app that has, um, that works with a camera and has a ton of things you can do with it, including filters, including, I don't know, focus distance, whatever the hell you can imagine. It is very complex and very cool. So um, if you ever wanted to build your own Instagram on the web, now you can just have a look at that and uh, tweak it a bit and basically have your own custom Instagram. It's a really nice demo. Does need Chrome 72 plus though, because it relies on some of the more modern uh, image capture and media stream and WebRTC APIs. So. All right, next demo we got here is Babel plugin transform rename properties, a Babel plugin for renaming JavaScript properties. I'm honestly not sure still why would you need that in some places, but uh, maybe for a code. I mean, I guess it just renames them on the build time, right? So it's not exactly a code mode, but you can rename properties on build time uh, for whatever objects you have. I don't know what the use case will be, but maybe you do, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is Memento, a development only tool that caches HTTP calls once they have been executed and essentially returns the cache on every subsequent request. Could be very nice for avoiding the uh, using APIs with uh, re, um, um, API restrictions. And uh, yeah, seems pretty convenient. So if you are working a lot with APIs have strict, uh, that have strict restrictions, that might be very helpful to you. So do check it out. We're all users that use the plugins. Uh, I'm not sure what he means by that, but uh, if you can elaborate Memphis, that would be great because I'm not sure I understand what you mean by it. But anyway, coming um, on, we got radial menu, a highly customizable radial menu that's very easy to set up. So it's yeah, essentially a radial menu that seems to be very nice. It's plain JavaScript, so you can use it with whatever you want. You can also have Web 2.0 gradients here if you want to. It actually looks quite nice. So, you know, if you're looking at something like this, do check it out. I mean, Babel plugins. Uh, I still don't get what you, I mean, I mean, I, I got that you mean Babel plugins, but what do you mean by reroll users? Well, what is, am I just, I, what is reroll? Am I just don't know something here, but um, please elaborate. Meanwhile, the next package we got here is React Reverse Portal. So this one is actually really cool. The idea is that you can uh, create portal node that can be, for example, memoized, right? And then you can use a wrapper component to render something within that portal node. So outside on the page itself, outside of the React, which can be quite damn handy. Um, okay, let me, I'll open this and we're gonna talk about that after I'm done with the demos. Right, continuing, we got page map. This is a really neat, oh, roll up. Uh, why would you, I mean, I, okay, roll up, I get it. Uh, yeah, okay, this is a roll up page. Why would you want to rewrite, like the thing I don't get is why would you need a plugin that renames properties? This is kind of my main gripe with it. 
I guess it could be useful in some cases, but I just couldn't come up with any cases that are handy. Like, why not just name them what you want in the first place? Why would you want to rename something build time? But uh, maybe I just not seen something. I'm, I'm sure there are use cases because it was built anyway, but um, yeah, let's go back to the libraries and demos. So next thing we got here is page map, as I said, and it adds a mini map for pages. So pretty much like the one you have in your VS code. It actually is a really cool idea. I really like that. So especially if you have a really big page, I got to try that in some of my things. It uh, takes your document and renders it into a tiny canvas that is interactive and shows you the minimap, which is a damn cool idea. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the model viewer web component from Google Web Components. And it allows you to easily display interactive 3D models on the web and in AR. So uh, yeah, it's basically a very neat web component to show 3D models that are interactive. And you can also use that for AR displays, which is uh, pretty damn fancy. And all you have to do to use it is literally just import some scripts and uh, use the model viewer tag with the source pointing to your model, which is uh, pretty damn cool. Next thing we got here is term page. Uh, term page allows you to create neat functional web pages that behave like a terminal. It quite literally allows you to make your own page that looks and behaves like a terminal. The setup is very straightforward. You can give your own commands and stuff like this. Seems quite nice. Also customizable styling and uh, blah, blah, customizable styling and everything. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is mesh spin JS, a library that allows you to, uh, well, spin meshes on the page and manipulate them in any way, uh, including animations, including uh, user controlled stuff and everything that you can imagine, rotate by mouse and, and so on and so forth. It looks okay. I mean, the interesting thing is that the meshes actually are SVGs. So this is the SVG graphics, all of this stuff here. I like, I guess it would be nice for some visualizations, but again, I'm not working with this area that much. So I don't know why you would want that, but maybe you do. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is site JS develop, test and deploy your secure site, uh, secure static or dynamic personal website with zero configuration. Yet another way to uh, deploy websites in a very one command, essentially. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's called site JS, but I'm not sure where the JS comes from because the installer seems to download the binary pre-built for your platform. Maybe it is written in JavaScript. Um, it does look interesting. So um, yeah, I'm, what, what, why don't you like static websites? Static websites are great. You can do some very cool things with it especially when they're automatically compiled and deployed from CI CD. It can be very powerful. But uh, yes, if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems pretty flexible. I don't think it's actually open source now that I look at that. Uh, but it is interesting nonetheless. All right, next thing we got here is socket D web sockets, the Unix way. Now this one is really awesome. So socket D is a tiny web socket daemon that allows you to wrap any script that runs on your computer into WebSocket interface. So the idea is that you build your app using whatever you want, Bash, Java, Python, Ruby, anything, right? And you use STD in to read the inbound messages and you use STD out to send outbound messages. And then you just run your app with WebSocket D. WebSocket D creates a WebSocket server that accepts the information and sends it as std in to the app and then reads from std out and sends it back through the socket to whoever is connected, which is a really cool idea. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It seems to be very nicely built and um, yeah, it's basically like CGI 20 years later and for web sockets, which is a great explanation, I think. So if you know what CGI is, you probably uh, will get the idea of this immediately. All right, uh, next thing we got here is React AST, render abstract syntax trees with React. I first thought that it literally allows you to render the AST as in, you know, the proper AST just fit it in there, but uh, you actually have to write the AST itself as React as well. So I'm a bit confused as to why would you want that, but uh, that's a thing and yes, it works and um, <laughs> you can write your AST in React. I don't know why, but maybe you do, so do check it out. It's an interesting one. 
Next thing we got here is the Reactive Search Web UI component. So it's the Elastic Search UI components for React, and uh, it basically covers any component you might need for searching through things, going through ratings, text auto suggestion, face edit search, rating search, keyword search, range selection, calendars, uh, date range, CD selection, whatever the hell you can imagine. All of that is here, all of that is pre built and basically automatically connects to your elastic search, which is uh, pretty nice actually. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Creature Chess, open source auto chess game in TypeScript, React, and Node.js. Uh, if you don't know what auto chess is, it's basically a game where you um, have to pick the units, then position them on the board, and then watch them fight the enemy units in unpredictable ways. So this is why auto chess. There is sort of a chess component to it where you have to balance your builds and creatures and so on and so forth. And this is just a version of it built on TypeScript, React, and Node.js. And you know, if you're interested, you can check out the source. If you want to play it, you can just play it here. You can also host the boat, just play it with bots and stuff. Works quite nice. It is, I believe, MIT licensed and sprites are CC by SA licensed. So very permissive, very nice learning material. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the Trumbovig. I, I don't know how to read that, you know, it's going to be Trumbovig here. Uh, it's lightweight and amazing. What you see is what you get. JavaScript editor, 20 kilobytes only, 8 kilobytes gzipped. And uh, it actually looks quite nice. So, uh, this is, yeah, it's quite full featured. Also allows you to use plugins for things like GIFs and embeds and images. And you can insert the kitty here and it works perfectly fine. Looks quite nice. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Also translated to 40 plus languages and automatically localized if you want to. Yeah, uh, looks actually really good. So if you're curious, do check it out. All right. And uh, the last thing we got here is actually not so much a demo or library, but as a showcase, I guess. What blew my mind is that it actually was written in uh, Node.js and JavaScript. So it's a CSGO exploit. Uh, Counter-Strike Go, the video game exploit that is written in Node.js and actually allows you to crash any Windows user that is playing CSGO with you on one server. So it actually taps into the Counter-Strike Go client, allows you to point on a specific user and, and then it will send him some packages and the user will die essentially, which is... Kind of crazy. The vulnerability has already been patched, so this is sort of the just to demonstrate how exploit works. But again, you know, the thing that amazed me is that it's actually written in JavaScript. It's it's a Node.js app that you can run with Node.js, and it is a pretty complex ex exploit that is written in in Node.js. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Don't you think so? So if you're curious, do check out the source code. All right, this is it for the libraries and demos. Now we have the last thing here for today. It's a website called howdns.works and it explains to you how DNS works in a very cool and colorful comic format. So if you don't understand how DNS works or if you have a vague understanding but wanted to learn more about it, then I would highly recommend looking through all of the episodes they have here. They do an amazing job of explaining how the DNS works in a very entertaining and very easy to understand format. And DNS is one of the, you know, Four components of um, well networking. So if you're working with Node or if you're working with browser, it doesn't matter. It's a really good idea to understand how DNS works. So I would highly suggest you to look through that and read through that because it is it's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, this is it from my side. So um, if you have any questions, suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. I will go to the swell tip point just in a few seconds. Um, as usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. As usual, if you have any questions, suggestions, you can join our Discord server and ask me there. And uh, yeah, that's basically it from my side. So now talking about swells, I actually did a live stream and there is a video on it, uh, the VOD for the stream on my YouTube channel if you are interested. I think Svelte is pretty cool. Like I definitely can see a use for it. I still like React more just because of the purely functional nature of it, but Svelte is great. Like I really like the way it comes out and I really like, like if you're working in a very resource restricted environments, you probably cannot build beat Svelte because the 
you know, the result it produces is super tiny, super efficient, super fast. And if you're not doing some crazy computation and some crazy re-rendering, Svelte is probably gonna win over React, uh, well, most of the time, to be honest, right? So I do like it a lot and I probably will use it for some projects, but uh, React is still my go-to technology, at least for now. Again, and uh, another very uh, big point about Svelte is that while it's great as a framework, the community around it is still like magnitude smaller than the one around React, right? So this is kind of the, this is what I have to say about it. All right, um, any other questions, suggestions, or maybe you built something this week and want to share it. Maybe you have some projects that I you think I missed, or maybe you have articles that you've written or just want to share with me. Feel free to throw them in the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap it up here and uh, go uh, have a rest of the weekend. There is a new frame in Warframe, so I got to farm that. A very important task. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, always more than happy to talk about new technologies. This is sort of why I'm doing this anyway, you know. So, all right. Okay, it doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So um, thank you guys very much for watching. As usual, if you missed the podcast and still want to watch it from the beginning, the VOD on Twitch will be available immediately after the podcast. The VOD on YouTube will be available as soon as I re-upload it there. Um, the podcast is also available in audio-only format on CastBox, iTunes, and, well, basically anywhere else. You can just find it. Um, YouTube channel link should be in the Twitch channel link somewhere down below, I think, if it's not there. Uh, just, uh, yeah, find it. I, I think it should be there. Let me, let me just quickly check, uh, just, just to make sure it is. Uh, yeah, the Twitter, Discord, uh, is it not here? Yes, there is a YouTube channel link. There you go. So it's in the channel description. More JS frameworks. Well, to be fair, there has not been new JS frameworks for past three years. I mean, Svelte is not new, let's be honest, right? So the Svelte 3 came out recently and, or was it Svelte 2? I'm always, wait a minute. Is it, what's the new one? Svelte 3 or Svelte 2? I'm, uh, is it, I think it's Svelte 3, right? So Svelte 1 is very old. Svelte 0 point whatever was released like three years ago or something. So there is, there hasn't been new JavaScript frameworks for years now. And um, yeah, and you know, let's just stop bitching about JS frameworks because it's, it, I get it, it's a meme, right? I know, but come on, come on. JavaScript is just as stable as a Python or Ruby or well, just about anything else. Yes, the language itself is adding features pretty rapidly, but frameworks, they're been stable for since 2000, 16, I guess, wait, 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 let's check. So Vue.js, Vue.js 1.0 release date. Vue.js came out in 14, okay. Svelte came out in probably 15 or 16. So Svelte 3 is the new one, but 1.0 was, oh God, I hate, why don't they have the last button? Um, 5.3, can we get like 1.0, the 1.0? It is, okay, there we go. So this was 2016. So it's been three years since we had a new front-end framework. Like something really new that changed the paradigm, right? And this like, even I wouldn't say Svelte did that because Svelte 3 did that, kinda. But again, you know, there's not exactly new ideas there. They're just very nicely implemented. So the real shift was React changed a lot. There was 2000, what, when was React released? React release date. It was like 2013 or something, right? That is 16. No, this is the older ones. I think it was like 13 or whatever. Yes, there you go. Six years ago. And then we had uh, Vue in 2015. And then we had Svelte in 16. It's like a few years apart. That is not that frequently. And yeah, you know, it's just, I don't think it's, 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 I mean, again, you know, I get it. It's a meme at this point and you can meme as much as you want, but let's be honest here, JavaScript is pretty stable and <laughs> there is not that many changes we get and majority of them are now language. Actually, the interesting part is the language itself is now changing more frequently than the frameworks, which is awesome because we're getting some really cool features like the optional chaining, pipeline operator and all that cool stuff. But okay, as I mean, just ranting here. 
Right, so um, there we go. Uh, this was BXGS Weekly episode 78. Thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Again, feel free to join our Discord server if you want to talk about any of that or rant about JavaScript frameworks. I'm always up for that. Um, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching a VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.